Welcome to Reading Between the Reels. I'm Matt Leader. And I'm Craig Dickinson. Today on the show, we're talking about Casino Royale, uh, the 2006 Bond film. So Matt, uh, this is it's a big film that we're doing today. It's, it's pretty exciting. The new, the new Bond film's coming out uh, just a couple days after this episode will be released. Uh, what, are your, what are your overall thoughts on Casino Royale? So uh, my... My overall thoughts, um, well, first, I, I kind of want to get uh, your background because uh, James Bond is a huge franchise, right? Um, I think it was back in the 60s when it started. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this is one of the longest running film franchises, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so, you know... I'll, I'll go ahead and start. I, you know, for me, I, I grew up watching the Pierce Brosnan Bond films, um, and I'm a huge fan. Um, and when this came out, um, I remember distinctly really enjoying it. And I wasn't sure. Like I said, I, I grew up watching Pierce Brosnan. And so when the mantle was passed from him to Daniel Craig, and I had, I don't think I'd ever seen anything with Daniel Craig in it. So I wasn't really sure. Um, and I honestly think it's a fantastic film. Uh, in my opinion, I think it's, it's one of the best Bond films there are. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a little difficult to compare films from different eras. And I, I don't think it's necessarily fair, um, just stylistically. But I think it's really a... It stays true to some of the roots of what James Bond is uh, while also kind of bringing it into a modern era and having some touching moments that I did not expect to come. (laughs) Uh, And so overall it was, I think quite fantastic. What about you? Yeah. See, I, I I love when we do some of these, uh, these, these films that have a longer history uh, because it really shows the difference in our ages, which cracks (laughs) me up because uh, like I was in college when the Pierce Brosnan one dropped, and and my my first Bond was uh, probably Moonraker. I think that was the first one I ever saw with mm-hmm. with Roger Moore. And so, you know, it's sacrilegious to say that Roger Moore was was my Bond for a while, uh, even more than I liked him more than Connery because that's just my the first one I grew up with. And uh, I remember, I think it was TBS that used to show like all the old Bond films like over Thanksgiving week. For a while, and so I've I've seen just I think I've seen them all pretty much at least pieces of them. I don't know if I saw or I've seen uh, Honor Majesty's Secret Service because that's just you know the Lazenby one, and it's just no one really likes that one. <laughs> but like I remember really liking Doctor No and Goldfinger, and like I actually really like Thunderball. I know there's a lot of people that don't like it, uh, but and I had seen Daniel Craig in in a couple of things before this. He's in uh, he's in Tomb Raider, the the Angelina Jolie. Uh, that's movie. right he the, is the first one yeah. yeah it has an american accent in that so that was the first thing i think i ever saw him in and then of course he's in uh road to perdition where he plays paul newman's son and he's doing an american accent in that too so i had some familiarity with him uh and i but i really liked pierce brosnan too when, when his when his stuff came out uh, i had been a fan of his for a while I liked him in remington steel which that's kind of a deep cut for people that are older or younger than me you know, anybody that's a millennial probably has never seen that or heard of that. But that was a very kind of James Bondy type of television show. And and at one point, he you know, he was going to be the Bond uh, after Roger Moore, but he couldn't get out of the contract. And that's where Timothy Dalton slides in. So he was kind of destined to always be Bond. And so when he becomes Bond for a golden eye, it was like, finally, we get Pierce Brosnan. And, and that was a lot of fun. What I find is interesting about this film, too, is that, you know, you have... Uh, Martin Campbell directs uh, this film, and so he kind of sets it off. And you know, he also did Goldeneye, and so it's kind of like he's the at least at this point was kind of the go to resetting the Bond franchise guy. And so uh, I thought that was was pretty cool. And I I gotta say that I think it's <laughs> I can't imagine a more difficult. I think making a movie is already difficult, but then you add in like the rebooting of a franchise that has millions of fans and has a very long history. And uh, some of it is uh, questionable or if like not 
what we would consider mo- modern, up to modern standards. I think um, there's a um, a Sean Connery one, and I can't remember off the top of my head where he turns around and like slaps a girl or something. Like sure. that would that would not fly. You know that that was you know that was maybe that could fly in the '60s, but now that that could not, right? And and so it's it, it is kind of taking. 007. And the other part of that too is just the the content itself because um 007 is very much kind of a cold war spy, right? And um this is addressed a little bit in one of the later uh, Craig films um Skyfall. This idea of whether this kind of cold war era spycraft is still viable. And so I think there's different levels of you know, coming into 2006, is this a franchise that's worth keeping? Is this, you know, on a meta level, is this, you know, is Bond worth keeping? And I think the movies thread the line pretty well. Um, and I think this movie in particular with with uh, Eva Green's character, uh, there, <laughs> I hadn't seen Casino Royale in a while. Um, and I had forgotten how romantic it is at parts. And there's little moments where it slips into almost romantic comedy. And to, ju- you know, jump into this, you know, there's a, there's the moment when uh, Bond leans into the bathroom, hands the dress, and, and yep. tells um, yep. Vesper, you know, I need you to look fabulous. And then he walks out, finds the suit laying on the bed, and comes back in and goes, what's this? She goes, well, I need you looking fabulous. And to me, that right there addresses both aspects for me, where it's like there's there's more of an equal stance between the female and the male counterparts, right? Where where um, Vesper is her own character. And she makes these really interesting choices throughout throughout the whole film. But it's also to me that's, you know, and he goes, it's tailored. Yeah. <laughs> and, and she's like, yeah, I sized you up first time we met and it's like that's got almost a little edge of like romantic comedy humor to it which i found just very refreshing like it felt so more like so much more human than like for pierce brosnan he's dripping in the cheesy one-liners and it's got you know this kind of over-the-top action and stuff which is very enjoyable um but he doesn't he doesn't have this really kind of human core you know there's there's times where he gets tortured and and uh, I'm talking about Pierce Brosnan here um and and so does Daniel Craig uh his bond but to me Daniel Craig's bond feels more vulnerable in this movie uh, and I think he's the most vulnerable in this one uh, with his relationship with Vesper. And that's just, that is just so entertaining to me. What do you think about, about all that? Yeah, I, I had a lot of that same, same stuff in my notes too, about how the earlier bonds, bond films had become very cartoonish, you know, it's almost like a spoof of themselves uh, up until this film comes out. And then this film is, and it's, you know, the filmmakers have admitted that this is very much a response to Batman begins. Like that's, became like the definitive way to reboot a franchise that had gotten too campy. And we saw that, you know, with Batman and Robin and like, how do we kind of cleanse the palate of that? And they kind of went the similar way, you know, and also having some of the uh, influence of like the Bourne identity, which is pretty gritty as well, where you want to kind of just strip things down, uh, min- do minimal CGI and really work on doing everything in frame as much as possible and to, yeah, to show Bond getting hurt. I mean, I wrote that down. He gets hurt a lot in this film, you know, physically and emotionally. Uh, there's a, it's a little bit Indiana Jones-like, especially like with the truck scene, you know, with the tanker trying to blow up the plane. That feels a lot like Jones. And then he can just see like the blood all over him and just he's getting dragged around and, you know, it looks like it hurts. You know, when he's has to, you know, has to electrocute himself to try with the defibrillator, that looks painful. You know, and it does, it kind of, it's a different way to to make Bond uh, an empathetic character where he doesn't feel superhuman. You know, it's like they've, they've broken him down 
which is an interesting way to go when you're when you know they're kind of like they're building him up by the end of the he's not bond like he's his name is james bond at the beginning but like really this film a lot is a lot about like how he gets his double o license you know how he gets his car the drink the catchphrase even his light motif doesn't show up until the end you know he's on this journey and it's like the bond that we know the polished almost impervious bond that like, doesn't exist yet at the beginning of this film and so I think that's a really smart way to to tell a story. Yeah, I mean it's it's certainly, you know, an origin story that's really well done, I think. Um, but it also keeps a lot of the fun. Uh there's kind of the flair. Um, and I forget the location. Are they in Monte Carlo for the the casino part? Uh it's supposed to be Montenegro. Montenegro. Okay. Which I, is I, a is a country in the Balkans, but I think it's it's actually uh Czechoslovakia is like yeah. the outskirts. Um, but you know, they, they have this, they have, and I found it also interesting that they chose Texas Hold'em, uh, right. cause I believe in the original novel, it's Baccarat, um, yeah. which I know, but I know nothing about. <laughs> so, yeah. I read something about, about that, that they, <laughs> when they did that on the, on the, I guess the, the first, cause this is the third time that Casino Royale has been, been filmed, which I thought was fascinating. It was an American Americanized version on TV where they had a little intro about Baccarat. This is how the game works before they actually got to the story because it was so uh, unknown and, yeah. and still is. I mean, I couldn't yeah. tell you how to play Baccarat. Well, and you know, and you know, I'm, I'm I'm going back in my my memory banks, but I feel like Texas Hold'em was very popular around 2006. Like it was, it felt like it was all over the place. So that was is also a decision that I think worked out well for the film. But there's the the same kind of um, fanciful air, right? Where you got people with lots of money, they're throwing it around. Uh, then you have that moment when, like you mentioned, he's electrocuting himself to try and start his heart back up after getting poisoned. And, um, and the humor there where Vesper has to come and plug it back in and do it for him. And then he uh, opens his eyes, looks at her, and goes, "Are you okay?" <laughs> and she goes, "Me, like." And so it's like moments like that where uh, there's little nuggets of of joyfulness and fun throughout the film. Um, I definitely see the the same uh, influence of the the Born movies. Um, I will say though that. Uh, I do enjoy the Bourne films, but the fight sequences, I hate them in, yeah. in the Bourne films because it's so choppily edited. And so yeah. I, I kind of paid attention to that. And I feel like this, the style of editing is much smoother and much yeah. more kinetic and put together. So, you know, as far as editing and that cinematography of the action and the fights, you know, there were moments when, when, you know, they use unsteady cameras. Um, perfect examples when, when Bond gets poisoned and he's walking out, the, right. the lens is fuzzy and it's moving all around with him, but it's very purpose driven, uh, cinematography, camera movement. Um, and when, when he's in the fights, you know, there are the, the uh, cut ins, the close ups of, of a knife or whatever, the machete or, or sword. There's things like that, but it's, it's much more put together than those born films were. And so I, I feel like it, it strikes a very, um, this kind of the sweet spot for me of using the editing to create tension and excitement without going too far and, and chopping it to, to pieces. Yeah, I agree. I think this is a perfect time to kind of just call out, uh, the work of both Phil Mahew, who is the the cinematographer who worked with Martin Campbell several times, you know, did both of the Zorro movies that he did, Mask of Zorro and Legend of Zorro, which are both very beautifully shot films. GoldenEye as well. He did that with him. And he also did a couple of other films, uh, The Saint, which is a very Bond type film and Entrapment also is is kind of in that same genre and all beautifully shot. And then edited by Stuart Baird, who's done a, an incredible amount of films, lots of great action films that I know I'm sure you like, both you know, Lethal Weapon 1 and 2. He did Die Hard 2, which is probably the weakest or one of the weakest entries in the, in the series, but still a great action film. 
Tango and Cash. He did that one. He also did, uh, for Richard Donner, did The Omen, Superman, Lady Hawk. So and also in Maverick, because that's another one. So, you know, he's, you have that experience, I think, too, to know the way to tell that story without feeling like it's forced, which I think it does a little, feels a little forced in, uh, in the born identity in those movies. Whereas this, it's like he can kind of just let the story play out and know maybe a little bit less is more in this case. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, were there any other kind of cinematography editing, anything else that, that really stood out to you? So, yeah, there, I mean, there was a bunch of stuff. The way that the film starts, uh, I always forget. It's been a little while since I've seen the film as well, that it starts in black and white and almost feels like it's a like a 1940s film, the way that it's uh, with the angles and, and the lighting. Uh, and then it then it inters- that's interspersed with, uh, you know, as he's telling the story of how he killed the first guy. And then it's almost like this gritty, almost like 1960s era where uh, just the way that it's shot and the lighting is super harsh. And so you have these two very distinct styles interspersed with there. And then you get the red when he spins and, you know, shoots, you know, essentially shoots the camera and then you get the red and then it turns into color. I thought that was just a beautiful way to, uh, to bring us into the present and really kind of amazing that it was also, you know, we have a character that's an older character. We mentioned this before. It's been around, I think the first book was in the fifties, first movie in the sixties. And so it's kind of a cool way to say, this is an origin story. We're going to kind of pay homage to that, you know, era of movies in the way that we're going to, uh, you know, set the film up. Yeah, that that uh, beginning kind of stood out to me. Um, you know, thinking about it, I don't know if they needed to go black and white. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I don't think it really, like, detracted at all. Um, I don't know if it really added anything for me. Um, you know, I, I can see, I didn't think about this at the at the time, but I could see it as an homage to the origins of, of Bond. Um, and I, I can see that it didn't bother me. Uh, but I was also thinking like, what, what does this bring? What does this add? And I don't think it really added anything narrative wise or character wise, uh, to the story. And I do think it's a little interesting that there's almost two prologues a little bit. Right. It's, I think it's pretty common to have like an intro, mission that bond is on to kind of kick the movie off and then yep. he gets to the, like the real mission you know um so you have the kind of his first and second kill and in black and white and then you also have the the beginning of the film where he's chasing down in a kind of parkour style the the bomber right which is of course connected to the rest of the plot but i i just thought it was interesting that they decided to do that because you are kind of, I mean, it's a fairly long movie and, and you're kind of lengthening it by adding the prologue. And, you know, I don't know what you think. Do you think that it was worth it story-wise, character-wise to have that that black and white intro at the beginning? I, I like it. If if I, The film is long, but if I had to part, you know, to kind of trim apart, it would be near the end. That feels a little bit tacked on uh, to me they've kind of stretched out a little bit and it's enough where I'm watching the film and going, um, this is going on for a bit. So I know something bad's about to happen because that's not how bond movies wrap up or really, you know, a lot of movies don't just have this very long epilogue, which it kind of seemed to be. And then you know, you end up with another action sequence, but I really liked the beginning. I, I liked, I thought it was a fascinating way to jump in, uh, with the black and white, but I really, really do like the free running sequence at the beginning. Um, the first time I saw that, I was just completely blown away with with how engaging that was. I think that might have been the first time I'd ever seen parkour or free running, um, which I'm not quite sure which one is it is. Uh, you know what it is? It's like this guy's running over stuff, um, and it's a great sequence though. Like we talked about the editing before, kind of being minimal. The editing in this is not minimal. I mean, like there is so much uh, switching of you know close to wide establishing establishing shots, first person shots, uh, bird's eye view. I mean, this was like the main thing I picked up with camera work was that this just never stops moving. It's so dynamic and it just engages you um, in just an incredibly immersive way. Yeah, that's, um, I mean, that's, I think they they nailed it 
with with the action cinematography. Uh, they did what they needed to do um, to keep things exciting, uh, but also keep it clear. And that's, yeah. I think that for me, from just like a pure mechanical construction standpoint, like if we're looking at, okay, how is this movie, you know, from a cinematography perspective, that says that it was well put together and also well directed. Um, was there anything else that caught your eye? Yeah, just just two more things. And they're really, they're, they're kind of related is that uh, I noticed at the beginning there was a lot of what they call golden hour shots where it seemed like they were, you know, shooting that's like right before twilight, uh, especially outside when he's talking with M walking through kind of that garden area where it's a very soft light. Uh, it's just beautiful. And then kind of connected to that is the, the gold that you see in the poker room in Casino Royale where it's just gold everywhere and the way that they've dressed that. Uh, dress that room is, I mean, it's clearly, it's just dripping with wealth. Everyone in that room is, you know, it's a $5 million buy-in. It's, you know, there's so much money being thrown around, but I can, you know, an absolutely intentional choice to make the walls and most of the fixtures gold, I thought was, was pretty cool. Yeah. And I, I think that's, you know, you described it well, that's the extravagance that I would expect in a Bond film. <laughs> Cause that's right. You know, that's, that's kind of who Bond is. He is a high roller. He's going after kind of the the big fish in the, in the ocean, as it were. Um, I do have to say that I I quite liked the soundtrack. Um, throughout the whole film, what struck me is you know you mentioned that the full Bond theme doesn't come in until towards the end because this is an origin story and we Bond isn't Bond until really the end of the film. But uh, throughout the whole thing, you get little segments of it just kind of sprinkled throughout, uh, just on top as he's showing up the casino, just doing different things that are kind of evocative of what we would expect of Bond. And I like that kind of building up of the story, right? So as he is becoming Bond, you get little bits of the Bond theme until towards the end when he kind of is the, the, you know, the titular character finally. Yeah. It definitely serves as a payoff. Like you've been waiting for it. If you've seen bond movies before you're, you're waiting to hear that song. There's what you're waiting for several things, you know, and it's, you know, these are things that they, they do with a lot of things. Like he orders the drink wrong, right. Until (laughs) he hasn't quite figured it out yet. You know, do you want it shaken or stirred? And he says, like, do I look like I care? Uh, the same thing with the music though. You're, you're waiting for, these are some of the, you know, the bond, this, the, the tried and true things that we do in a bond film is to hear that music over and over again. And we don't instead we hear fully, you know, fully realize we hear the theme, the main theme, Chris Cornell singing, you know, you know, my name, which I was again, blown away. I, I love Chris Cornell. I liked Soundgarden. I liked, uh, Audio Slave, big fans of both of those bands and his solo stuff. And it was just, what an interesting choice to have that guy. You know, one of the big grunge acts uh, singing the theme song. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's like a kick in the pants. But you also have um, David Arnold, who did, you know, the Independence Day soundtrack, which we talked about a couple episodes ago, does the theme music for this. And, you know, he co-wrote that song with Chris Cornell, You Know My Name, and now he's using it as an instrumental uh, to kind of weave that through. And I thought that was kind of a cool connection that, you know, we'd mentioned we did Independence Day that you have, you know, this British guy doing this kind of Americana film. And now it seems like you've got, you know, him more in his element, right? Cause like it does it bond is very much, you know, it's a, it's a British guy. It's a, it's a British film and you've got this British guy doing the music. And, and you know, again, that, that just kind of goes back to, um, you know, James Bond is, is this kind of classic British character and uh, again, kind of paying homage to, to its roots. Um, and speaking of that, uh, I don't think there's anything that really uh, talks about or, you know, speaks of homage than uh, Judy Dench being in this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good transition. Yes. <laughs> Let's talk about Judy uh, Dench. Segue, right? Uh, Beautiful. But it's, she's kind of a classic. She's almost like the foundation, right? Where it's like, you, you come to your house and it's like, it's always there. 
and Judy Dench just feels like a part of the Bond franchise. Um, and I know she leaves in Skyfall, right? But uh, right now, it still feels like she's kind of in her wheelhouse of yelling at Bond through a phone. And, um, you know, despite it being a different Bond, doesn't matter. She's still plenty happy to yell at him. Um, and uh, from there, I, I think all the acting is is pretty good. And they got some some pretty well-known actors in this film. Yeah, no, definitely. And, you know, Judy Dench, it, Bond is, I should say, you know, the Bond films had a lot of carryover with actors. Like, you had the same guy playing Q forever and same actress playing Money Penny forever, regardless of who Bond was. And so continuity wasn't really a thing. So that's kind of like one of the carryovers. It's kind of funny. One of the carryovers is not having continuity uh, of who's playing M, uh, except for you kind of do because it's kind of a sequel, but it's a reboot. But it's Judy Dench, so who cares? It's awesome. Uh, so you have her. Like Daniel Craig is fantastic in in the role. Uh, I really like. Uh, I think Eva Green is is really good in the film. Mads Mikkelsen is a great bad guy, and you have several other guys in here that are that are also like everybody's good in this film, and most of them you'll recognize the face more than you will the name. Uh, so I won't bore you with the names, but uh, it's a great. It's a very well acted film. Oh, Jeffrey Wright. I'll throw his name out because we've seen Jeffrey Wright in lots of stuff. As Felix Leiter, he's he's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I think Eva Green brings, like I said, that that sense of of true romance to the film, where the chemistry between her and Daniel Craig works really well. Um, you know, when when they're um, kind of falling in love throughout the film, I totally buy it. Um, and the scene, though, that really seals the acting for me. Um, and like I said, you know, I grew up with with Brosnan and, and watching the older ones. Um, was the torture scene? Um, the way that Daniel Craig sold that. I mean, it was. I mean, for me, that's easily the most intense part of the film. Yeah, it's um, brutal. But he. <laughs> He imbues it with this kind of perverse humor where he's making jokes while being tortured. Yep. <laughs> uh, and it just, it works, right? Like, it looks like he's in pain, but he's fighting back. Um, and then I think he says it like one point where, um, you know, like to, to Mad, Mad Mickelson's character, he's like, you're, you're going to die, right? And he has this kind of um, chuckle where it's just like, you know, you might be hurting me now, but I'm going to win. You might win the battle, but I'm winning the war. Um, and uh, just just that, I, I think it, it just sold it for me, where it's like, okay, I, I'm bought in with this guy. Um, you know, it's, you know, the, the music drops out. Um, it's just an intense scene. And I think that's that for me is like a make or break scene. Like either you sell it or you don't. And he sold it. Yeah, I, I am thoroughly convinced that he is being hit in the groin area repeatedly. Like it's it's brutal. It's it's right up there with you know the torture scene in Reservoir Dogs for me. It's yeah, like you you don't want to watch it, but you can't look away. It's it's That's that a perfect well done. way of describing it, really. Yeah. So. There's a lot of great lines in this film, and you pulled out some really good ones before. Uh, I, I also had the, the dinner jacket thing where it's tailored. I thought, just fantastic. Like that really does just that. That scene alone just kind of sums up their relationship beautifully uh, between uh, Bond and Vesper. Did you have any other lines that you really liked uh, that you want to pull out? Because I have a couple. Yeah, um, you know there was <laughs> there was a line that uh, uh, right after he gets uh, resuscitated, right. Like how how are you doing? Are you okay? Yeah. yeah. Um uh what's his name? He's not Felix Leiter, but the other guy who's kind of helping. Oh Mathis. Mathis. Yeah. Yeah. Uh he has a couple lines, uh, a couple moments, um, when they're talking about the police chief and he says something like, Your odds have just improved, Mr. Bond. Um and then um when they're hiding the bodies. And he says something like, uh, just because you're dead doesn't mean you can't help. 
Yeah. Um, so that's pretty great. Yeah. Kind of like with, um, with Brosnan, there's, there's a lot of good one-liners from the film. Um, and, and so that also for me makes it fun because the one-liners are cheesy, but they're, they're still really fun. And so it, it kind of brings back like, okay, this, this is still that roller coaster ride for me where you're getting some humor, you're getting some action. In this one, you're getting some some romance and some character development. Like I said at, at the beginning, I, I think it, it's pretty fantastic. Were there any other lines that stood out for you? Yeah, I had, uh, well, it, along with that one where he get, he comes back after resuscitating himself or getting help with Vesper, he says, I'm sorry, that last hand nearly killed me. That's you know probably the most campy, uh, but it feels like a warm blanket. It's like, hey, that's what Bond would say. It's, it's super cheesy. Uh, I like the part where he orders the drink and, uh, I have it written down cause it's so long. You know, usually he says, you know, vodka martini shaken, not stirred it's to the point. Here he says, uh, he says dry martini. The guy says, we oui, measure. And he says three measures of Gordon's, one of vodka, half a measure of Kina Liel, uh, Liet, shake it over ice and add a thin slice of lemon peel. Like that is so not cool <laughs> that he says it, but then everybody else is like, yeah, I want one of those too. I just, that's hilarious that they kind of play that up as he's kind of figuring out like how to be cool, even though it's it's like he has this weird balance, right? Where he's, he mentions earlier, he says he calls himself a blunt instrument, but he also has to kind of be sophisticated and he's still kind of figuring those things out. Uh, that was a real, I think an instance where he's, he's not quite succeeding in the, in being sophisticated, but somehow it works anyway, because they still think he's cool. When I think for me, uh, that's I, that's like the beauty of this film is that yeah. he's not this kind of perfect, suave, you know, secret agent all the time. Like, obviously, he's still pulling it off, right? But I, I feel like the like the Brosnan films, he was kind of in that mode, whole movie, right? Where this yeah. feels much more like an actual arc throughout the film. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, my last line was actually from really early in the film. And really, you could put just about anything Judy Dench says because she's so dry and it's amazing. But she says, this is after they have, you know, Bond kills the kills the bomb maker. Uh, and then the fallout from that. And she says, in the old days, if an agent did something that embarrassing, he'd have the good sense to defect. Christ, I missed the Cold War. It's a great line. It's just, <laughs> she's just so irritated at him. It's like, you should have just died or just left. But I have to still deal with you, uh, which is amazing. Uh, I will also say uh, the costuming choices for Bond in this film, kind of going along with kind of him becoming that suave secret agent, are a lot more casual than we've seen in the past. You know, he's wearing a lot of short sleeve shirts, khakis. It's almost like a Hawaiian shirt at the beginning. It's very like he'd kind of blend in. He's not always wearing a tux or, you know, you know, nicely pressed pants. He, it's a lot more grimy and like it works for the film. It's different than what we've seen in other Bond films though. So that's kind of a cool, a uh, cool change. And I really like what they did with uh, Le Chief with his eye, with the contact lens and, and the eye scar. It's actually really subtle. You know, that's another thing where in earlier Bond films, it's like if a guy has a deformity, it's super obvious. And his name is probably related to that, uh, that deformity. But with this, it's like, yeah, this is, you know, realistically kind of how this would work. Sure. And I, and I feel like that's carried on through the rest of the Daniel Craig Bond films. Mm -hmm. uh, just that idea um, where he's definitely willing to be more casual, I feel like, uh, in his dress uh, in certain situations, of course. Um, but, and then you also have the flip side of the extravagant tuxedos and dresses and stuff. Um, but there, it feels more, there's like a more broad variety of, of costumes. So let's skip down to, to setting and design. I, I, I think we, we mentioned before, a lot of it was shot in, in Prague. Uh, some in the Bahamas, there's some great stuff uh, in Italy where you have Lake Como, which I've seen that in a lot of films recently. But every time I see it, I'm like, oh, Naboo. Um, and of course, it's shot in, in Pinewood at, at the Bond Studios. Uh, yeah, so that's another thing. You know, they try to film a lot of things in real world locations uh, as opposed to on a green screen. 
And I think that that pays off. I mean, I think the the film feels very grounded as far as setting. Um, and in some ways kind of very similar to the Bourne films. But those also felt very grounded and real in, in terms of setting and design. Um, I haven't seen this one, but it doesn't Bond go to space? Is that Moonraker? <laughs> That's me. Yeah, that's Moonraker. <laughs> so and the guy has the metal I think teeth. You, you mentioned earlier where it's like some of the Bond films border on parody of itself. Yeah, and and this feels like and and the other uh, part of that with the with the props is you don't have a lot of the fancy gadgets. Um, <laughs> you, you still do, right? Yeah, uh, but they're much much more realistic, I guess you'd say. Uh, with the defibrillator, uh, with the, uh, I don't know what you call it, the anti-venom, you know, thing he's, sure. he jabs in his neck. Um, yeah. But, the you know, syringe, yeah. Yeah. But like going back to even the the bras in, in the 90s where it's like you have the remote, remote control car with like <laughs> sure. spikes and caltrops and oil coming out the back. And it's like, that's just so goofy. I mean, I love it, but it is goofy. <laughs> Yeah. And and this is very, very different. And it feels very toned down. And part of me kind of misses, and, you know, it's like you can always revisit the older films for that kind of goofy, fun adventure. But, um, yeah, for better and for worse, I think it's it's much more focused on reality. Yeah, well, we don't have Q in this film, right? He doesn't show up until, you know, Skyfall, so... I believe that's right. It's been a little while, but so that's, you know, the, the weird gadgets and stuff that, that wouldn't happen yet. We're kind of building toward that, uh, you know, from in, in world perspective, but yeah, they are, you know, keeping it more grounded, even down to having those early 2000 cell phones, which look super dated, uh, at this point. And yet their computers are still more modern than what we have now, which I thought was an interesting dichotomy between those two things. And I love that you mentioned the defibrillator because I had that down as well as it's fully a checkoff's gun with that thing right he gets into the car for the first time and like it that's the drawer that opens first before he can get to the gun like hey there's something there we're going to show you later and it's going to be important yeah definitely so we talked about uh we talked about characters i think already but is there anybody else uh as far as the actors that you want to mention i know there's a richard branson cameo did you did you catch that when he's trying to go through the tsa screening no I, I did not yeah, it's really quick. It's out of focus. Uh, it's when when Bond's trying to catch the guy at the Miami airport. It's a it's a blinking or you know miss it thing. But apparently, it's been uh, cut out if it's on British Airways because it's a competing airline. So that's pretty fun. Um, I know. I think it, I think as far as characters, I you know I think that is. I think we've kind of talked about all the the main characters at least for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's it's an international cast. You've got you know lots of people from lots of different countries and nationalities, and I will not try and pronounce most of their names because I would butcher them. Uh, Giancarlo Gianni is the one who plays Rene Mathis. He's fantastic as well. There's a little bit of a confusion about whether or not he actually betrays Bond. How did you read that? I'm. I know. I just put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, not entirely sure. Yeah, it's kind of vague, right? Because, you know, there's initially you have Lashif, Matt Mickelson's character, saying, you know, that your friend is actually my friend. And then, uh, but then later on, M says, you know, it was actually Vesper that was the one that, you know, kind of betrayed you. And so he's like, yeah, but it could have been two. So they kind of leave it open ended. And, you know, I, I need to watch Quantum of Solace again because I don't remember if he shows up again. That's that's horrible for me to say that, but it's been years. Nobody watched Quantum of Solace in a while, but we're all going to rewatch them as we get ready for uh, No Time to Die, I'm sure. So, yeah, I, I kind of uh, read it as most likely it was Vesper who betrayed yeah. him. And that's probably, probably, I guess, what I would believe is that yeah. was her. Well, if we have any listeners anywhere, and if you'd like to chime in with that, that would be that would be awesome. We'd like to hear your thoughts on that. And part of what makes I, me believe that is in the black and white, um, Bond kills the guy because he's a double agent, 
right? Right. And so that kind of makes me think that they were kind of planting the seeds for that to come back around. Maybe. I like that. Uh, I'm just scrolling through here. You know, we had usually, you know, we had Hero's Journey when we did Star Wars and that's not a thing we often have, but essentially this, this film is kind of a hero's journey for Bond. You know, he's not fully realized uh, until the end where you have that, you know, the great scene where he announces, you know, he says Bond James, he says the line, there it is. And the movie and the, and the music kicks in uh, that he's finally become Bond. And so that's what this movie is. You know, it's kind of a hero's journey, you know, but anti-hero's journey, I suppose, you know, with his dark side, but, but definitely kind of hits a lot of those same beats. And uh, we've talked a lot about the world building, that it feels like, you know, this could really happen. It's it's not even that hyper-realized, not even as much as like Christopher Nolan's world building, where it feels like, yeah, that could almost happen, but it's a little outside the realm. This feels like, yeah, this this could be happening right now, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Any final thoughts? So the biggest thing... My biggest takeaway uh, from this one is that there's way more twists in this movie than most traditional Bond movies have had. You know, I, I, and I wrote this when I saw the the Mathis betrayal. I'm like, wow, that's that's kind of a twist late in the game, and then it just keeps giving you fake endings. So I was like, almost as many fake endings as Lord of the Rings, not quite, uh, but the, it keeps coming back. Like you have, well, you know, he's gonna retire and he's going to go live off with Vesper and then she betrays him. And then, you know, she dies and he kind of tries to decide whether or not he's going to still be in love with her. And he goes back to MI6. And then you even have the ending where he shows up with Mr. White. And the fact that, you know, both Lashif and Mr. White are only small parts of this larger conspiracy. And the fact that you have, you know, you have Bond set up as you know, a movie where the natural sequel happens. We had never seen that before either. I mean, that's part of the way, you know, the charm of the Bond movies where they're all one-offs, every single one of them. And now you have kind of this five-part saga and we don't quite know the end of that yet. But when we get to, when we get to Spectre, it kind of retroactively says, guess what? All these guys were part of Spectre. Uh, and so that's kind of a fascinating, fascinating thing. Yeah. What about you? I, I, I completely agree with everything you said. Uh, I, I don't think I really have any other thoughts. I think we summed up everything pretty well. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, No Time to Die. The, the next Bond film should be out, I think. I mean, this is this episode will drop on, on Wednesday. And then this. I know there's people that have seen it already. You know, the, the, the American release will be, I'm sure, those Thursday night shows and then, you know, the weekend uh, of the 8th. So if you haven't seen... Casino Royale in a while, or the other Bond, or the other Daniel Craig Bond films. You know, now is an excellent time to revisit those uh, as you get ready for the ending chapter of this five-part saga. So, as we close, we just want to say thank you so much for listening. If you would like to connect with us, you can find us on Twitter and Facebook. Email us at readingbetweenreels at gmail dot com, or use the Speakpipe app on our website. And if you enjoyed the show, please leave us a review on your favorite podcast catcher. We'd love to hear your feedback, and it really helps a lot getting the word out about the podcast. Also, if you haven't yet, join our Facebook group. It's a safe place to share your thoughts and discuss all things related to movies. One last thing. Our next episode will be a review of David Lynch's Dune and a celebration of our first year of doing the podcast. Send us an email or voicemail about your favorite moments from the show, and we'll share them on the next episode.